back to Share Vancouver podcast, everyone. Today we have Sattvik here with us. Hi, Sattvik. Hi. Hi. Looking very handsome, dapper. Thank you. I dressed up just for this. Yes. Ooh. Love you feel it. special. <laughs> Sattvik here with two A's, two T's. We'll get into that. <laughs> Wears many different hats from an actor to appearing in a Bollywood movie. Um, Indian TV show and also one of the determined activists who is currently one of the petitioners before the Delhi High Court seeking the legalization of same-sex marriages in India. He currently lives in Vancouver where he runs his own economic consulting practice and is also studying for a PhD in business economics at UBC. So welcome Satvik. Thank you. Really happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And shout out to Shervan for the third documentary for I Migrant, which is sharing the lives of immigrants moving from India to Canada. Mm-hmm. And that's where we learned about your and Gaurav's story and how really the reason why you moved here was simply you wanted to live a happy life, get married with Gaurav. Let's start with your journey to moving to Canada first mm-hmm. with Gaurav. Gaurav and I have been together now for about eight years. And uh, we decided to, you know, we, we met when we were in India, um, we had a blast of a time in India. We have we had a great life in India, but uh, it became apparent fairly quickly that the country wasn't moving forward with LGBT rights at the pace that we would have liked. Um, you know, we do come from a colonial background. Uh, the sort of seeds of the oppression were sowed by the, the colonial powers. Um, but, you know, we have been independent now for a fairly long time, and we'd expect that we'd move forward at, at a pace that befits the, the pace at which India is moving forward in the world. Um, but sadly, we found that that wasn't the case. We found that um, it was hard to do simple things like rent a house. Uh, because people wouldn't rent a house out to bachelors. Uh, And of course, God forbid that we tell people that we were in a relationship, uh, because that's even worse than than being a bachelor. Uh, So, you know, there were these strange... I mean, it would have been funny if it wasn't so sad, but there was a time where we uh, had to, you know, pretend to sort of be friends. And, you know, we had this meeting with with the Residents Welfare Association of this place where we were renting this house. And this old uncle sat down and said, Deko beta, you know, we don't want any of these, uh, um, you know, we don't, we don't want any dodgy activities. We don't want girls coming and all that, you know. And I said, no, sir, we, there are no girls. We will not bring any girls home. We promise we won't bring any girls home uh, you know I am a I am an economist I have this business I do this and he works uh, he's a Canadian citizen and it's going to be fine and you know we had to put up that charade again and again and something as simple as renting a house yeah. so even considering getting married having children is such a you know an uphill task that you feel that you're going to be fighting for the rest of your life and at some point, we just figured that, you know, it's not worth the... F- I mean, it's, 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 it's really sad, but we do have the option of moving, and it's just easier to live a life of just dignity. You know, it's, uh, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, w- what I want um, is what many people want, is just to have a family, to settle down. I want the life as an adult uh, that I saw my parents live, where dad would come home and mom was home, and we'd all sit together and we'd have dinner. Uh, I want my kids to experience what I experienced when I was a kid. So, and that just seems so hard to do in India, which is such a travesty because it's such a beautiful country and it has so much to give, but you know, it's just impossible for us to to experience this. So we decided to move. And how has it been here, you would say? Um, It's been, uh, you know, there, there there is the cultural adjustment of moving, you know, across the world. Um, We moved smack bang in the middle of the pandemic. So August of 2020, um, everything was closed. It was really hard to meet people. So the first year was very lonely, Um, but it's become better. Uh, We've, you know, um, since the pandemic has uh, subsided a bit, we've made a lot of friends. 
Uh, we're enjoying the outdoors that Vancouver has to offer. Uh, I'm enjoying studying at UBC. Uh, I'm enjoying doing my consulting work. So, you know, life is good. Um, it could be better because Gaurav is still traveling quite a bit. So we, we tend to not spend as much time together as we'd like. But, you know, hopefully that will change. I want to know how you guys, you and Gaurav actually met, what your guys' love story is. Oh, my goodness. Um, it's actually a, a pretty crazy story, the way we met. It's crazy enough that if you saw it in a film, uh, you'd sort of come out thinking, there's no way that was possible. That Come on, that's just like bad writing. But, but this actually happened. So in late 2014, I was uh, struggling to be an actor in Bollywood. Uh, and I had just sort of, uh, you know, I was part of a play and the, the thing hadn't worked out. So I was essentially without a job in, in sort of late 2014. Um, and I was, you know, on the verge of turning 30 and I was super depressed and oh my God, where's my life going? I gave up this amazing career in London and I moved here and now I don't have any work and I'm getting old and yada, yada, yada. And so I was so depressed and it was New Year's Eve and I had nothing to do. And so this friend of mine who worked as an assistant casting director for Yashraj Films, which is one of the biggest, big. sort of, yeah, yeah, su yeah, super big. Yeah. Uh, so he sort of, uh, you know, obviously super busy as an assistant casting director for Yashraj Films, uh, but sort of took pity on me and said, okay, come meet me for, for dinner and, you know, I'll listen to your sob story. And then I have to go to the New Year's Eve party with the Yashraj gang. And I said, great, uh, at least someone's, you know, at least I'm not going to, you know, lie alone in my bed <laughs> crying myself to sleep. So. Uh, he met me and I don't know what happened, but I think he sort of took so much pity on me and said, you know what, why don't you come with me to the to the party? And I said, you know, it's uh, isn't it like a Yashraj thing? He's like, no, they know you. It's fine. Come. And at this point, of course, I was not out because you, uh, I mean, I was out to my close friends and family, but I wasn't out to the world because uh, in Bollywood at the time and to an extent even today, casting directors tend to cast you for what you are. So yeah. if you want, uh, you know, you can't be like a gay person seeking roles that romancing women. So if you're, if you're known to be gay, then chances are you get the gay roles. Um, so we went to the party and sort of me and my friend, sort of two gay men just sitting there, uh, surrounded by extremely hot men, because, you know, that's what the Yashraj courtier <laughs> involves, lots of extremely hot men, you know, trying to be heroes. Um, Wait, did you know that Gaurav was gay at that point? I, I hadn't, I hadn't met Gaurav oh, at this okay. point, right? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so we go to this party and we're just sort of looking at people walk in and suddenly this boy walks in, uh, who sort of strikes my fancy. Uh, within within five minutes, he's made friends with everyone in the bar. And this, by the way, is in the smack bang in the middle of Bombay's sort of Bollywood district, right? So the whole place is full of Bollywood people. Um, within five minutes, he's talking to everyone. Within half an hour, he's dancing his ass off. Uh, everyone's looking at him. It's very obvious that he's gay from the way he's dancing. And, you know, I'm sitting thinking, wow, this guy's got some guts to come Confident. into a party like this. Yeah. Um, so, so sort of that's how we, we, that's how we met for the first time. We started talking at the party, we exchanged numbers. Um, he had, strangely enough, just landed that day from Canada. So oh. he was on a, a, a reality TV show in Canada called Bollywood Star. What? Yes, he was. And uh, he had this dream of going to Bombay to be a Bollywood choreographer. So he found cheap tickets for New Year's Eve. He lands on New Year's Eve, crashes, wakes up, says, take me to a party, meets me. Then, uh, but he doesn't have a number. So it takes time for us to get connected over the phone, by which time he's in Ahmedabad, which is a city 700 kilometers away from Bombay. And I'm just like, didn't you just get here? He's yeah. there for a music festival, a classical music festival. Now, since I am not working at this time, I decide to just jump on a bus and go to Ahmedabad, mostly to listen to classical music, but also because I'll have company while that's going to happen. And so this first time we saw each other completely sober was outside his friend's house in Ahmedabad, uh, where we realized that we were going to have to explain our friendship to his friend. Mm. Uh, so we cooked up some sort of story, went into his friend's house because I was crashing there for the night and instantaneously look at his friend and realize that his friend knows me from, from our time in London. 
Oh. Wow. Yeah, in Ahmedabad. All connected. Very random. <laughs> and, 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 you know, we connected properly over these overnight concerts in Ahmedabad. We came back, I think, on the 9th or 10th of January. Uh, on the 16th of January, he came to my house, met the parents. And in March, uh, he moved in. And, uh, you know, we were... Excuse me, that's two months? That's two months. Oh, uh, it, I it, like this. That's how, that's how quickly we clicked. Bada bing, Aww. bada boom. Yep. And we got the chance to meet Gaurav at the picnic. So cute. Yeah, yeah. Such, a, such a nice guy too. Oh, yeah. I'm so lucky. I'm super lucky to have him. Aww. Gaurav, we wanted you here, but I know you're in India right now. Is that right? He is in India right now. He's working with uh, Aditi Mangaldas, who is uh, an absolute legend in the Kathak world. Mm. So Aditi Didi is making a new solo that's premiering on the 4th of December and Gaurav is helping her with that. Amazing. Uh, so yeah, so he's over there and I'm going to go join him uh, in a couple of months. Amazing. Yay. So good, yeah, because he does some really great cross-classical dancing um, from what I've seen and done a little bit of research on him as well. So really cool, really, Aww. really cool. Oh, he's absolutely amazing. Uh, and he's, we're, we're going to make, um, we're, we're planning on starting a new piece when he comes back uh, in sort of January, February. Uh, and so, you know, watch this space. There's going to be a lot of interesting stuff to watch. Yeah, it'll be shared that you were in the show Everest and you were appeared in that Bollywood film, which we got to see. We found it. I saw your part. <laughs> I was like, yes, <laughs> we have someone famous here with us. So yeah, maybe talk about your experience in the Bollywood. I know I know you mentioned like if someone knows that you're gay, you're gonna be in the gay roles. But like even the actors who are the gay role in the movies, they're so like, come on. Why are we still presenting gay men as like so feminine? It's kinda like a mockery. You know, it it, it has it has gotten better over time. Now. It has. Twenty twenty two. Well, you know, we you're coming from there's two ways of looking at it, right? Yeah. There's a glass half empty and a glass half full way of looking at it. Uh, the way I would like to look at it is that uh, I see that the pace of progress in the entertainment and the media industries in India is way faster than the state of progress in the laws mm -hmm. in India. Yes. Um, you know, you go from a time in the 90s where there was basically no representation at all or whatever representation was uh, existed as, you know, you know, completely effeminate men who were more often the butt of jokes than, yeah. you know, anything else. And then, you know, you move to films like Dostana, which, you know, uh, a lot of people criticize now because, you know, yeah, it's two people play acting and yada, yada, yada. But you have to realize it was really uh, path breaking at the time because it was the first film where, you know, Abhishek Bachchan's mother, Kiran Kher, ends up accepting, you know, and being okay with, you know, and that journey for me is the real takeaway of that film. Where, yes, they're, they're pretending because that's the only way the audiences of the time would have accepted it. Right. But um, the, the message that the film pushes is that it's okay to be gay. All the time, it's okay to be gay. And you get a character that's homophobic at the beginning that moves to being completely okay at the end, which was pathbreaking. And then you move to a Kapoor and Sons, yeah. where, uh, you know, you completely do away with the stereotype of the effeminate, uh, 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 the effeminate gay man. And it's a serious story about, yeah. uh, about, you know, what they go through. Cut to now, where after the judgment, you've got, you know, gay characters everywhere. Especially uh, web series. Web series, yeah. TV shows, uh, you know, like Sushant Divgikar became a very big thing after he was on Big Boss. Mm. Uh, Faizi was on, I don't even, House of Cards was it, Faizi Boo, who's a, who's a good friend. Uh, you know, there's, there's TV shows where episodes are dedicated to trans characters, gay characters. There's web series where prominent characters are gay. Um, there's movies where prominent characters are gay. So now it is uh, sort of becoming a lot better. Um, just in terms of representation. Yeah, it's normalized before, yeah, because in the 90s, I grew up watching the 90s, the 80s films, um, but I'm not, I don't watch so many, so much so now, mm -hmm. but yeah, I think that it's definitely made a huge drastic change because I never, we grew up, I never saw any of that stuff ever, you know what I mean? So you're right, it has taken a huge stride in actually showing representation and kind mm -hmm. of normalizing that within the Bollywood scene. Yeah. Um, so now, it's great. a slightly different story for people who are behind the scenes. Right. In terms of what you as the audiences see, there's been quite a lot of movement. But for people who are acting, 
Yeah. Like for, for actors, we still uh, operate in a sort of environment in in India where casting directors cast you for who you are. Like they, the, the 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 mindset is that the best way to cast a character is to find someone that actually fits the character, mm -hmm. right? And so if you have a gay role, you get a gay person to play the gay role. If you have a straight role, you you get a straight person to you know you find someone that that sort of is this character in real life. And so that creates a bit of a barrier for, for people who want to act. So for me, um, that was the reason I chose to go back into the closet when I was, when I was an actor. Uh, and when I came out in sort of 2017 uh, publicly, um, it did affect the sorts of roles that I was called to audition for. Like, almost instantaneously there was just like a lot of like oh there's this perfect role for you bro you'll love it when you read it and i'm just like it's another gay role isn't it wow. you know which is what's the point of me being an actor then <laughs> you know? yeah. like being gay is an important part of my identity but it's about as important as me being vegetarian or me being south asian yeah. or me being a musician or and any number of things um it's not the only thing that defines me yeah, and acting is to play a role. At the end of the day, it's not defining who you are on screen as well, right? So that makes complete sense. It's a bit of a shame that that's how it's kind of unfolded there, but yeah. We also have an issue right now where, uh, and, and this is, you know, it's a big issue right now with either cisgendered women or cisgendered men playing trans roles. Right. Yeah, and this is happening quite a lot right now. And this is something which, uh, I mean, I personally, uh, you, you know, by the same logic, it's, it should be fine for straight men and, and straight women, or cis men and cis women to be playing trans roles because that is what acting is. But uh, it's, you know, there are no trans actors that can carry a film. Right. That's and what so they're saying about Chandigarh. That's Kariyashi, what they're saying right? about Chandigarh. If they had a trans person maybe they wouldn't get as many people to come watch the exactly. film so it's like such a battle because you want to educate but you almost have to cast the people who have a name who are famous yeah so people like who are not in the queer world will watch the film yeah but you know the the, the side effect of this is yeah. that trans actors have no opportunity to yeah. play main trans roles and i think that's a massive travesty yeah, yeah. so you know it's uh the good thing about all this, though, is that things are moving and that we are having these conversations, that this would not have been an issue 10 years ago, but it is an issue now. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Maybe you can talk about your experience with Everest. Everest was so much fun while I was doing it. Of course, I was not out. So um, it was fun from a purely, you know, acting perspective, because strangely enough, it was a role which was the complete antithesis of what I am as a person. This was a role that where I was... I had to play like a negative character who was a Haryanvi Jat biker boy. Ooh. Yeah, it was the farthest away from how I am in real life, which made it so much fun to play. Um, to add to it, uh, you know, Ashutosh Goarikar was producing it. And, you know, Ashutosh Goarikar, the person that made Lagan, the person that made all these amazing films. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he was on set quite a lot. And sometimes he put his director hat on as well. And it was an absolute pleasure to just, you know, work with him. Yeah, and it's about a girl who wants to climb Everest. And, and I was playing the sort of uh, she goes to this mountaineering institute to learn how to climb and i was like the bad student in that <laughs> courtier so like it was she led the good group i led the the bad group and we always sort of clashed and it was super fun we went all the way up to the nehru institute of mountaineering in uttarkashi wow. we stayed there for a couple of months um and it was just an absolute blast and so um you know i i'm 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 quite sad that the show didn't get as much traction as we were hoping we want to um, watch it. You were saying, what was it? It was, yeah, it's, it's available online, right? It's so, available on Hotstar. Yeah. Hotstar, okay. Uh, you need an account, but I think once you have an account, which is free to get, uh, you can watch this show for free. And I'm in episodes 9 to 26. Perfect. Um, but you might not recognize me. <laughs> <laughs> we saw your photos. You were like, a rip. I know you've written some plays as well. Um, and those were, you were able to showcase some of those in India. Maybe you can elaborate on a bit of that work that you've done as well, which is really, awesome and amazing because I'm sure it's also hard to navigate that in India given that there's oh you know 
what's the population there? Billion? <laughs> One point four billion. One point four billion people, <laughs> and everybody's probably trying to get into acting, <laughs> playwright, you name it. Um, so that's really great. That's that's awesome that you were able to uh, do that. And I know you're also saying that you're trying to hopefully bring some stuff out here in Vancouver. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I started writing plays in 2012 um, after moving back to India. And I figured that, you know, um, I, I uh, as a theater person operating primarily in English, um, there was just a complete lack of um, of, of plays that that in English for Indians, uh, a lot of the English theater in India was still, you know, you'd pick up a Tom Stoppard play or you'd pick up a, a Harold Pinter play or basically like plays meant for white people. Mm -hmm. And then people looking like me would get up onto stage and put on a very posh received pronunciation accent and then do the, and it would just be like a complete farce. Right. Yeah. And there was just nothing that talked to the lived experience that that I as an urban Indian had. So I started I decided to start writing. Um, the first play that I wrote was uh, uh, based on a book uh, called Ten Years with Guru Dutt, Abrar Alvi's Journey, which was a book about uh, the, the great filmmaker Guru Dutt and his relationship with his primary writer Abrar Alvi. Um, the plays that I am most proud of, uh, there was a completely original play that I wrote called The Pad, which was about, uh, which was about minorities in India. Uh, it was about two couples that inhabit the same flat six, six months apart from each other and how their lives sort of turn into mirror images of each other. One of the couples is gay and the other couple is Anglo-Indian. Now Anglo-Indians, um, as you might know, are people that have ancestry, uh, that have British and Indian ancestry. Yeah. Um, and they are a sort of a minority in India that are sort of fading away now. Um, uh, so, you know, there was really interesting play that, that I wrote there. The play that I uh, really like and that I perform the most is a play about, it's a mono act. It's a play about the origin of drama. Uh, it's based on the first chapter of the Natya Shastra where uh, Bharat Muni recounts the story of how Lord Brahma creates performing arts um, and recounts the story of the first play ever made um, and how the, uh, the, the, the asuras, uh, the demons, were very unhappy with the subject matter of the play and uh, in the performance of the play get mighty offended and start protesting and start you know, uh, try, trying to disrupt the performance and how Lord Brahma has to come in and sort everything out and give this amazing speech about the nature of performing arts and why performing arts exists and what you should take away from it. Um, and I feel that that's, uh, you know, I perform it in Sanskrit and a bridge language, uh, either English or Hindi, depending on the audience. Um, and I feel that, that that's so brilliant because uh, just in the, you know, where India is right now, culturally, where there is this resurgence of interest in our past, in our past, our ancient past, which is, you know, not been accessible to people for a very long time. Um, there have been many people who claim that space and very few people that have actually read the ancient scriptures. And the, this play is a wonderful way of like introducing people to, you know, the ancient scriptures and showing them, hey, there's a lot of great stuff there, but there was, there's also a lot of objectionable stuff there. But both of them can coexist. Our history is not black and white. It's actually many, many shades of gray, often different shades of gray at the same time in different places, right? So that's the play that I really like and, you know, hopefully uh, might revive it at some point if I get the time. Bring it back. Yeah, bring it over here for oh, sure. I think there's a huge peak of interest for people to learn, yeah, India's background, its history. Um, and like you're saying, like Sanskrit, like that'd be so great. Yeah, it's been nice to see that they, they are up, up and coming and hope to see one of your plays out there soon in one of the festivals or yeah. just in general. Because we've yeah, I've seen a few over the last few years, but not enough. <laughs> well, honestly, though, um, I feel that, you know, for me, at my stage uh, in, in my life, the acting and the theater is very much a side thing. Uh, and if I have any free time to devote to the, the creative side of me, um, that time's going to go to help Gaurav create his piece. Uh, he's a professional dancer and you know he has stories to tell. We're working on a piece, we're going to start working on a full length uh, sort of dance production inspired by the poetry of Bullesha. Um, and, and you know that's the project that we're going to focus on 
next year okay. uh, and he's going to be doing it full time and I'm going to be helping as as and when I can so so maybe not next year but you know after that once this production's done so we have things to look forward to in the new year with you and Gaurav oh absolutely yay okay I wanted to go back to you saying in 2017 that's when you decided that you wanted to sort of come out and I know you had a blog post about it can you talk about that and maybe what was the reaction of the people in the industry, your own family members? Right. So, actor? like I mentioned, I went back into the closet when I, you know, when I was trying to be an actor, um, and you know, I was constantly confronted with these situations where you know you wanted to say that you were gay, but you couldn't. Mm. There was a situation where we were traveling from Delhi to Jaipur uh, for a play. And uh, there was, you know, the makeup artist that was very uh, sort of obviously gay uh, and was crying because of stuff that had happened to them. Um, and, and I, you know, I sort of tried to reach out and I said, listen, I know that it's bad. It, it gets better. And, you know, with tears in his eyes, he turns to me and says, how would you know? Right. You don't know. You don't know until you've gone through it. And I wanted to say, no, I do know I have gone through it, but I couldn't. Right. Um, and, you know, it sort of all came to a head when, you know, Karan Johar uh, wrote this biography of his where he very famously didn't come out. Yeah. Right. He yeah. said that, oh, everyone knows who I am, but I'm not going to say it because I might get arrested. Yada, yada, yada. So, you know, and of course, it is not for me to judge what Karan Johar does or doesn't. He is way more accomplished than I am. Yeah. He, you know, but in my view, if you if you are in a position to come out, you must come out. You must come out because it gives because because a it gives young queer people role models, yeah. but b it you know when people there's research that says that when you know a gay person you are much less likely to be homophobic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And it, it's 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 your it's the debt that you owe to the community to come out in in my eyes. <clears throat> so it sort of came to a head for me after reading you know Karan's autobiography. So I wrote this blog post. Uh, more out of a sense of frustration. Um, but then that blog post went viral. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, it, it was amazing, the outpouring of, you know, it got picked up by some media houses. Um, the outpouring of support was amazing. Uh, I had people sort of like adding me on Instagram and on Facebook. Um, and many of these were, you know, young people from, uh, you know, villages or like small towns in India, uh, you know, saying that, you know, this is amazing that, you know, now we have someone to, so, you know, more people should come out. And even today I get people, you know, today is not five years later, I get people messaging me for advice on, you know, how to handle coming out. Um, and, you know, I feel that if, if, if that post has helped changed even like one mind, it's sort of done its job. So, um, of course, professionally, what that meant was I only started getting auditions for, for LGBT roles. But I think, uh, you know, after that, I'd sort of weighed things and decided that the acting world just, at least especially in Bombay, wasn't for me anyway. So yeah. that was fine. Yeah, I know we were also like, uh, you know, Sharon was asking just about like your family and like coming out with some videos that you had sent uh, just for like your bio and so forth. Um, and how awesome and open and accepting they were. We had the pleasure of meeting your mom at the last month's picnic. And what a dream. Uh, she's such an amazing woman. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so sweet. To have and your like, whole family in a video, just like there was, your yes. brother is like, I'm a chiller. I know. I it didn't like, really matter. Yeah. I was like, oh, <laughs> what kind of amazing family is this? Well, you have to remember, <laughs> you know, this is the beautiful thing about this. He found out when he was nine years old. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right. He found out when he was nine years old. And at that age, society hasn't brainwashed you yet. Yeah. Right. Your sense of what is right and wrong comes from what you think as a nine year old. It doesn't come from what society tells you. And that should show people that, you know, homophobia is something that you that is learned. Homophobia is something that can be, you know, uh, homophobia is not natural. Yeah. Yes. That's um, and, and so I have been super lucky, honestly, uh, touch wood with my parents, with my brother. Um, coming out was never an issue for me, mm -hmm. at least with my family. Right. The bigger issue was. Do we tell our relatives? Do we tell the extended family? But, you know, we did slowly, slowly. And down to the last one, everyone has been super supportive. 
and you know i feel super blessed that i was never made to feel in my home that there was something wrong with me like being gay was like if they knew that i was gay aged 13 yeah. and since then it was fine yeah that's it it was never a topic of discussion even you know like it was never you know yeah totally well, that's awesome yeah no i love hearing stories like that for sure um this might go down like a bit of a deep hole but we want to also touch on i think uh, the, the bigger picture of how uh, you and Gaurav are fighting for the right to be married in India um and where you guys are standing on that i know you guys petitioned in 2020 from what i recall reading about right so so the petition well so gaurav's not a petitioner because he's a canadian citizen so he doesn't have any sort of standing with the indian okay. courts in this matter uh but i am a petitioner um so so let me just talk a bit about the petition um marriage in india unlike in many other countries is not organized under one law marriage in india is organized under at least five laws um for indian citizens there are four laws three of which are religious laws there's the hindu marriage act a muslim marriage act a christian marriage act and then for indian citizens that are that are from sort of you know cross cultural cross religion marriages or people who want don't want to get married under a religious act there's the special marriages act for marriages between an indian and a foreigner there is the foreign marriage act so, so many acts there are these are so there are five yeah. acts because marriage in india as you can imagine with the diversity of cultures each culture looking at marriage slightly differently yeah. uh, you had to accommodate all of that so the founding fathers decided five acts um and there are petitions targeting many of these acts so one of the petitions uh is targeting a foreign marriage act and is filed by a couple that is one of them is an indian citizen one of them is a us citizen uh webhav and parag whom you know very well uh there's a uh, petitions targeting the hindu marriage act our petition targets the special marriages act um we filed the petition in 2020 um the indian legal system takes time uh and so we still haven't got to the point where uh, arguments are being held in open court you know the pandemic intervened um but we're hopeful that you know once it's in the system it will eventually come to fruition and we're we're hopeful that it comes to a, a good fruition so let me just you know tell you a little bit about the petition that we've that we've moved um our petition sort of represents people like myself that have left the country because of not having the right to marry this four of us uh, and uh, what we bring to the table mainly is just a, a a recognition that this has consequences not allowing people the right to marry not allowing people the fundamental right to marry has consequences because it pushes your best people away and that has economic consequences for for the entire country so to start off there's a world bank study that 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 shows that just down to uh, the increased rates of depression uh indian uh, lgbt community members have rates of depression that are 6 to 12 times as high as the general population yeah. um suicides in one survey 6 15% of all respondents were classed as extremely high risk for suicide i personally have two friends that have committed suicide because of the exclusion that's been imposed by society on them yeah. right um hiv prevalence you know this is a country where sexual health services are not available freely um uh, th- there there are surveys in which as much as 16% of all men who have sex with men and over 50% of all transgendered people have been found to have hiv So if you just take the amount of you know and all and on top of this there are issues with uh in increased PTSD um anxiety uh violence that is perpetrated on people of alternative sexual orientations you take all this together and you know while it's a it's it's a massive injustice to the people that's involved and that's without question um it also impedes people's ability to participate in the workplace they they just become less productive the world bank study estimated that just because of increased rates of depression suicide and hiv india amongst the lgbtq community india might be losing as much of 1.3% of its gdp a year wow there's evidence that even when lgbt people participate in the workplace they are less productive because of all these issues 
and that might take off another 0.4% off of GDP. Wow. There's evidence that uh, LGBTQ exclusion lowers general productivity because it means that co-workers cannot benefit from the support, ideas, innovation that, you know, uh, 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 th that someone without stress and anxiety brings to the workplace. So there's correlations that have been documented between LGBTQ friendly policies and things like uh, stock returns, asset prices, uh, per worker output, rates of innovation. It's no wonder that over 90% of Fortune 500 companies have LGBTQ uh, uh, po uh, friendly policies and non-discrimination policies. Mm -hmm. Now, all of this collectively leads, as I was saying, to an exodus. The literature refers to this as the gay brain drain. People move not for economic reasons, they move just to live a life of, of dignity like me. Um, there's very few surveys in India about this, but there's a survey from Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong, which is a fairly developed place, but a place where P LGBTQ people cannot get married. 50% of men who have sex with men in this survey wanted to leave Hong Kong. And over 90% of those that wanted to leave cited not being able to marry as the primary reason that they wanted to leave. Not only does it push people away, it stops foreign investment from coming in. Mm -hmm. There's, again, documented uh, correlation between LGBTQ-friendly policies and rates of foreign investment, rates of uh, entrepreneurship, rates of uh, highly productive companies being started. Now, you put all this together and you have massive effects. Um, countries that allow LGBTQ people to get married, on average, have a per capita GDP that's between 54 and 64 percent higher than countries that don't. So it is really up to us as a country to decide where we want to be. Do we want to be with that group of countries that is, that is innovative, that, that affords the citizens high levels of productivity with high uh, per capita GDPs, or do we want to continue to be in this group of countries where we deny equal rights to all our citizens? You are just spitting some good facts, but also there's a consulting coming through. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I honestly didn't know like that much in, in, you never think about like queer folks affecting the country in terms of like the growth, the economic side of it. Yep. But again, that's your expertise coming in so and it you, makes sense. If you want, I can share a version of our petition where all these facts and a few more are listed so you can you know read yeah. that for yourself 100 percent. yeah we'd love to share it as well with uh yeah our audience just so they can kind of yeah if they want to read upon it a bit more mm -hmm. for sure so you teamed up with the other six queer couples who have moved out now you all have moved out is that right from so india there's uh so so our petition is not couples it's yeah. just four individuals four individuals and uh three of us have already moved out and one is in the process of moving out yeah because we take that, I guess, living in Canada for granted. Like, yes, you know, queer, we have Share Vancouver, a large queer South Asian organization. But here, I, I'm not sure if you noticed, even though queer South Asians have the legal right to marry, it's so rare to actually see queer brown folks who are married. And like when we met Jag, that was like our first time. We're like, what? Yeah. So rare. Like, so even though we have the right, here, here it's more like the cultural, mm -hmm. society, parents, family acceptance. That's the battle here. Mm -hmm. We've got the rights, we've got the freedom, but even us just, we're both so uh, still like fearful and like a lot of folks are still closeted here. And I know you talked about the privilege of coming out and folks who can come out have made our journey a lot easier, like Jag, Alex, because we do need those people to be out there to give us hope and representation. How has that been for you seeing that like, yeah, you're coming here. You, did you think that the queer South Asian community would maybe be more open or do you find them open? Well, you know, I've sort of been through this already when I was in the UK. Um, oh, yes. And so when I was in the UK, I was um, very taken aback by how uh, culturally conservative the South Asian community was. Um, at, you know, at that point, when I was, you know, much younger, I, I, I was of the opinion that, no, you should just come out. You, know, you should just come right. out. It was in the UK that I saw that, you know, coming out can have consequences in the South Asian community in a, in a way that I'd never even imagined. 
um, you know, I'd met people that were thrown out of their houses um, in London, of all places, right? Uh, and it really hurt. And, you know, this is actually sort of in a very weird way come home to roost because Gaurav's parents aren't completely on board with the idea of him being gay and us being in a relationship. I mean, they're improving, but, you know, they, they also come from, from that space. Um, I suppose that a lot of it has to do with the, you know, the class of migrants that come to, to, to places like this. Um, many of the people that migrated here come from rural backgrounds, um, who, which tend to be a lot more conservative than the backgrounds that I'm used to as a city boy. Yeah. Um, and so I think in that way it is natural, but it does pain me. And, you know, I, it, it does pain me that even though we have the rights here, we, you know, we do, we still struggle with acceptance and, and I definitely feel that more needs to be done. However, I will say this, imagine how bad it is in villages in India right now, mm -hmm. because we don't even have the rights there. Yeah, yeah. I can't We've even only know, yeah. just decriminalized it properly. Yeah. So while things are moving, there's a much harder battle to fight back home than there is over here. So, mm -hmm. you know, you know, I just keep that in mind as well when you consider where we are over here. Yeah. No, we definitely feel privileged and blessed. And when we see like the pride videos happening in like Amritsar, Chandigarh, Delhi, mm -hmm. we're like, what? This happens? Like, yeah. Very but, shocked last year. Yeah. That. Or sorry, this year too. I was like, oh my God, that's like amazing. But you know, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the, what you see are um, people from the urban elite marching. Yeah. Like Chandigarh is very, I would say, elite in India, in Punjab, right? Like. Yeah it's it's not in a village it's not, it's not in, in the, the smaller village. towns like yeah. you're not going to see that because whoever's in those i mean again i'm not 100 percent sure but i'm pretty sure and i'm sure probably sure you're sure that if it was happening in a small little village those people would be having a lot of repercussions oh, absolutely uh, you know what i mean so and what i talk, you know when i talked about sexual migration the gay brain drain it sort of it operates yes on, on an international level it also operates inside the country like you you overwhelmingly see lgbtq people want to move to places like delhi and bombay uh, yeah. because at least they can live some semblance of, of of their lives without having to hide it whereas it is really hard in some really small towns mm -hmm. uh, and like i have friends who've been forced to get married you know just because of that's the way the family works and it, it is uh, there's there, there's a long way to go yeah yeah, I will even here too. I feel like culturally within the South Asian community here, just like you're saying in London as well, it's 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 yeah, it is a bit conservative. I had lived there as well uh, for a little while, and I felt it was quite. I actually from from Canada, I thought it was a little bit backwards. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think there's still a lot of work to do here as well, mm -hmm. and we'll get there. It's just going to take yeah. time and, and and generational changes with us as well, right? That are like getting educated, educating the, the youth, um, and bringing community together, right? Yep. Yeah. Oh, well, let's talk about the 2018 landmark decision for, what was it like in India when that was announced? Because for us, seeing that going all live and viral on Facebook, Instagram was like, what? Like, this is happening? And also, it, it was illegal and, like, it was a criminal act. Like, sometimes you forget, like, you know, being, living abroad, taking that for granted again, that, wow. Well, 2018 was bittersweet because yeah. you have to remember that the NAS petition was filed all the way back in 2001. Yeah. Um, and in 2009, the Delhi High Court did decriminalize homosexuality. When I was a student in Oxford, homosexuality was legal. You could go back to India. And when I went back to India in 2012, it was perfectly legal, right? Because the law in India is if High Court gives a judgment and no other High Court opposes it, then it becomes the law of the land. So from 2009 to 2013, it was legal to be gay in India. Then a two-judge bench uh, of the Supreme Court reversed that decision in 2013. So then it became illegal again. But what happened is that in those four years, so many people came out. Mm. A, a movement was built. And then shoving all of that back into the closet, under the carpet, was just impossible. Wow. So. 
even within the legal fraternity, people kept telling the Supreme Court, listen, we think you've made a mistake, we think you've made a mistake. And so, you know, a curative petition was was filed, and it is extremely rare for, us, for the Supreme Court to reverse its own judgment on something. And this was, I think, one of like a, a, a tiny handful of cases where that happened. So, you know, there was a sense of relief more than anything else in 2018 that, you know, they admitted that they made a mistake with the 2013 judgment. Um, the real flowering, I think, happened in 2009 when the Delhi High Court did it. And then after that, it was just like a lot of anger when the Supreme Court went back. So, uh, you know, I mean, I was super happy when it happened. I unfortunately wasn't in the country on the day that it happened. Yeah. It happened a day before my birthday in 2018. Oh. Um, and I flew back the next day and it, there was partying everywhere. I was on a couple of TV, uh, like uh, news channels discussing it. Uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was very gratifying. It was um, step zero. Mm -hmm. and, and now there's many more steps to go. I didn't know that the ruling was passed and then pushed back. I didn't know that. That must have been like a really crazy time in terms of like, was there like wild protests happening and things like that during that time? I remember I was dating someone at the time and uh, this person wasn't out. And, and you know, one of my main arguments to him was, listen, not just wasn't out, was having trouble accepting, mm -hmm. right? This is a journey that all gay people go through. Yep. Um, and, and, and I kept telling him, I said that, listen, the law says that it's not an issue. And I remember that day he came over to my house and he looked me in the eye and he said, well, now the law also says that it's an issue. Oh. What am I to do now? And then we just cried for about half an hour. Um, it was devastating when uh, that yeah. happened. Yeah. But, you know, baby steps. Last names are such a huge thing in the South Asian community. And mm -hmm. I think even worldwide, really. Um, so yeah, if you can just elaborate that, elaborate on that a little bit more. Well, um, so there's two primary reasons why I don't have a last name. Uh, the first is that uh, my great grandfather uh, was adopted. Uh, he was found, uh, it's not entirely clear to us, but he was found in the early 1900s, wrapped up in some cloth, either in a train or on the railway station somewhere in, in, in Firozpur, in Punjab. Um, and he was adopted by the station master. Uh, and so he took the surname of the adopted family. But at some point, uh, there was a falling out and, and he left home and gave up the surname he sort of took on Kumar, which is a very generic surname. Uh, but then he died very early on, as you know, people did back in those days. He died age 35, uh, leaving, you know, his eldest son was my grandfather, who at the time was eight years old. And his wife, who lived a fairly long life, actually, uh, raised these four children on her own in, you know, the early 1900s in, in Delhi. My grandfather decided to completely do away with the last name. Uh, started out with Kumar, but, you know, ended up as just being Harjit. Um, and uh, the reason, you know, he did it and the reason we continue to do it was because uh, a surname, as you said, means a lot. It carries a lot of baggage. Now, we don't have any of that baggage. I would love to carry the baggage of my ancestors. I just don't know who they are. Right. A surname gives away in India your religion, yeah. your caste, the hereditary profession that you did, where you come from. And in a modern age, we feel that none of that is important in understanding who you are. We want to be known for our actions, for what we do, rather than what our ancestors did or where they came from. Um, I am agnostic. I don't subscribe to I mean, I, I, I now self-identify as a Hindu agnostic, but, you know, I am agnostic. Um, I don't subscribe to organized religion, and I definitely don't subscribe to the caste system. Yeah. So uh, for, for all those reasons, we've kept it that way, because this forces you to, this forces you to know me for who I am and what I do, rather than, than, you know, what community I belong to. Thanks for sharing that with, you know, our audience, and uh, hopefully that kind of carries on, you know, with a lot of people. I feel like that's like, Guru in Sikhism was trying to have just core and sing and to drop the last names. And I think it's the same idea. And the, interestingly, this is an idea that has come up again and again over history. You know, like we, yeah. we thought that we were pioneers, but it turns out we weren't. Yeah. <laughs> because, uh, because, you know, the, the surname Mishra 
in which is very common in India, right? Um, literally means mixed. It means mm. mongrel, right? Mm. So people who in like Uttar Pradesh have the surname Mishra, the, the, the genesis of Mishra is we are mixed. We don't know. We don't care. Wow. Yeah. Right. So, so this is an idea that that has uh, you know come up many a times in our history. So, yeah, you know, carrying on in that long tradition. You, despite wearing so many hats, also have time for yourself, and you like to play tabla. We watch your video. You're going wild. <laughs> I have a tabla as well, and my skills are <laughs> very non-existent now after I watched your video. <laughs> but maybe you can talk about that, and yeah. Bring it to one of the Share Vancouver events. Oh, absolutely. I mean, music for me was, uh, you know, th there were growing up, there were three things that I, you know, compartmentalized my life into studying, which I still enjoy, um, my theater, which I still enjoy, and my music, which I, which I still enjoy. Um, the, uh, I was fascinated, as every young boy was, in, you know, the India of the early 90s by Zaki Hussain, who was everywhere was absolutely fascinated by the sound of it and was and then I was very lucky to find Pandit Ashok Moitro who was from the Banaras Gharana who became not just a teacher to me but almost like a third parent um, whom I derive much of my moral compass from uh, and who in himself is not just a great musician a very learned scholar but a very wise man with 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 so much to share and so much to teach so I am eternally grateful for for classical music being in my life. Um, it has carried over into so many aspects of what I do. It teaches you discipline, it teaches you reflection. The inner peace that you get, you know, when you're practicing and you're repeating the same phrase for like an hour, the inner satisfaction and the peace that you get when you completely drown everything else out, it, it is a form of meditation as well. Mm -hmm. And I am so thankful that 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 has in my life. It's it's the reason that Gaurav came into my life. It's you know it's the reason that I went from doing English plays written by you know white authors to exploring how I can marry this really Indian music side of me and this really Western theatre side of me and started writing plays. Um, you know it it comes up in my work because the same work ethic carries over. So it is. Uh, honestly, if, if you haven't ever learnt uh, in, uh, any Indian music, then I would highly encourage you to look at Indian classical music and, you know, explore it. What I heard was Sharon wants you to teach her how to play the tabla. I was trying to explain to her. I watched the video and I was like, I'm like, she was like, his hands like, I was like, I was like he was like, like <laughs> and she's like, I don't know what that means. I'm like, go watch the video. It's very, amazing. Very impressed. Yeah, oh, very, very impressed. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I just pictured Gaurav dancing and you playing the tabla for the next. You know, there we go. You know, I have, I have pitched this idea to Gaurav several times. Uh, Gaurav, for some strange reason, I think he thinks I'm not good enough and so refuses oh. to dance with me. But uh, uh, yeah, that, that hasn't happened as often as, as you would expect, given the fact that we live together. Yeah. <laughs> Practice makes perfect. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I am, I am an amateur. I'm not a professional and he is a professional. So he needs people of that caliber to, to play with him. So. Awesome. Oh, well, then he definitely doesn't want to be dancing with me. <laughs> Let me tell you, he'll be like, get out of here. Um, well, yeah, we're pretty much come to an end. And we want to say thank you so much for coming through and sharing so much insight, so many facts and about you and who you are and what you're standing for and what you're fighting for in the Indian yeah. high courts, which is amazing because we need more folks out there like yourself fighting for that. Thank you very much for having me. It's been an absolute joy pleasure, a privilege to be given the opportunity to share my story. Um, huge shout out to Share Vancouver and the wonderful work that you do for the community here and indeed for the community back home. Uh, you know, and I hope to see Share Vancouver go from strength to strength. Yay. Thank you so much. Thank you. We can say bye. One, two, three. Bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye.